Hello and welcome to In the Hyperloop Education. This is a series where we'll talk to the scientists, technologists, engineers, artists, and mathematicians who are building the Hyperloop. The first educational conversation was with Aaron, who's currently a graduate student at Purdue University studying aerospace engineering. He was on the Purdue Hyperloop team for the first two SpaceX pod competitions. And after working in many different areas on the team, he designed the magnetic levitation and braking system and also worked as a project manager. I hope you enjoy this discussion on Hyperloop magnetic levitation. Aaron, thank you so much. I'm super excited to learn about Hyperloop magnetic levitation. Thanks for taking the time with me to go over this. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm certainly interested to talk about this. All right, so this will be a brief introduction about Hyperloop magnetic levitation. Uh, there's certainly a lot to learn on this topic, both from the fundamental basics of magnets and also just about the actual physics and the engineering and all the applications. It's a really exciting topic, but this hopefully will get a very brief rundown for those who are interested in Hyperloop. So first off, we'll go through a very basic introduction about magnets. Uh, as we all know, magnets have a north side and a south side. The north side of one magnet is going to attract the south side of another, but the north side is going to repel the north side of another. We also have these things called magnetic field. You can see in this picture that there's these lines, magnetic field lines. Lines are kind of partly an artistic definition, partly a mathematical definition, but there's some uh, meaning we can get out of these. But like the more lines you have in a certain area, the stronger the magnetic field. So here you see near the poles, so very close to the north and the south poles, we have uh, more magnetic field lines, so the magnetic field is very strong in the area. As you go outwards, you'll have a less and less field lines, so your magnetic field is going to get weaker as you go. This is very important because it tells us how a magnet's going to interact with other objects. So if you have some magnetic interaction going on with something, it'll be stronger if the closer the object is to the magnet. So now some base, some more basics. Uh, obviously, uh, magnets are attracted to some objects, and they have no effect on other objects. Some metals, like steel and iron, are going to be very strongly attracted to those magnets. Other uh, metals, like aluminum or copper, are not attracted, and the wood and glass have, you know, are not affected at all. So now we'll get to the exciting stuff, the magnetic levitation and breaking. So this is a much less, uh, much more complicated to understand, but we'll try to go through it. So when you have a magnetic field changing over a conductive surface, you end up with a lift or a levitation force and then the breaking or a drag force. Now let's break down that statement so we can understand it better. Changing magnetic field can just be as simple as taking a permanent magnet and just moving it. Or it could be something more complicated like having an electromagnet, which is a magnet that you can power and you can do some very interesting things like power on and off, some other very interesting effects. But the basics of if we just take a permanent magnet and move it, we have a changing magnetic field. And the conductive surface can be just anything like aluminum or copper or some metals like that. So what happens is after you have this moving magnetic field over the conductive surface, eddy currents are formed within the surface. Eddy currents are just electric currents that form in this conductive surface due to changing magnetic field. And uh, these eddy currents end up producing a secondary magnetic field that is opposite to the first. And then you get your lift and your breaking force. So here we have two, uh, on this first image, uh, we have a very common experiment, simple one you can do at home. If you have a hollow copper tube, or it also works with the aluminum tube, but it's more commonly done with copper. And you drop a cylindrical magnet through this copper tube, you'll notice that it drops very slowly compared to if you just dropped it in free air. Well, that's because you get this breaking force that's going to be always acts parallel to the surface or opposite to the direction of motion and it slows your magnet down significantly. Image at the bottom there shows a different one that's a bit harder to do like at home but you can still try it out. So if you take a say, giant aluminum plate and move it under a magnet or move your magnet over the aluminum plate, whichever way it works, you'll get a lift and a break force. So you see here the eddy currents form in the aluminum surface, and uh, that'll also produce that lift and break force. <clears throat> Just to interrupt, I've, I've actually seen the upper image uh, in action in, before, and it's a very strange, the, the cylinder drops very slowly downward um, through the cylinder, and it's just a very bizarre thing. You can't believe you're actually seeing it. <laughs> but Yeah, um, it's uh, very not intuitive for sure, I and mean, yeah. it's definitely worth everybody trying it out. Yeah, and uh, um, the other um, thing that, looking at those eddy currents, I've, I've seen um, iron shavings uh, kind of, uh, you know, sprinkled over a magnet, and you can actually see the kind of the currents of those iron shavings uh, align with the currents and stuff, and that's kind of a new, that's a cool way to visualize. 
um, this. As yeah, well. that's uh, that kind of goes more similar to a previous slide we saw yeah. the magnetic field. Oh, yeah. You can see the magnetic field form, mm -hmm. yeah. or you can see it around a magnet if you put a magnet into those iron shavings. Mm -hmm. So moving on, uh, now the uh, forces that happen from this are uh, also very interesting. So if we go to the point, you know, go back to the idea of having just a permanent magnet moving over a conductive surface. So let's just say aluminum uh, plate. We get a, uh, now here we have a force versus a velocity or speed graph. So you get, again, two different forces. One's a lift force that's going to act perpendicular to the, to the aluminum plate and a drag force that's parallel. Uh, so you see the drag force kind of increases at first and it's very high at low speeds, but then it'll decrease as we continue on at very high speeds. But the levitation force keeps increasing forever uh, and it asymptotically approaches some large value. So here, you know, depending on kind of your what you want to do, if you want a levitation or a braking system, using magnets, you'll have to change your magnetic setup to get these forces right where you want them. Because for a levitation system, you know, you can't avoid the peak in the drag. That's just naturally that's what's going to happen but you want that coasting kind of once you get to your high speeds you want that lift to drag ratio to be as high as possible but for braking you don't care about lift you probably want to actually minimize that and you want obviously a lot of drag so there's a lot of things you can do and that's kind of the complicated design aspect of this challenge but mm -hmm. a, these are two fundamental forces that we need to be aware of so next thing is a uh, hallback array so this is instead of taking let's say one large magnet you can take some smaller magnets and put them in this orientation shown in this first image and uh, the point here is you increase the magnetic field on one side make it negligible on the other side and that way by increasing on the one side you get that stronger magnetic field interaction so that'll boost both your uh, braking and your levitation forces so here in this picture the arrows are in the direction going from the south to north so in there that direction and by putting the five magnets in this orientation you get that array hmm. and this uh so you see both the magnetic field lines but also the colors which also represent magnetic field strength in the area and you can see kind of this case theoretically it'll be double twice as strong the magnetic field on one side and zero on the other side realistically it doesn't quite work out that way but it's uh still very much boost that effect and the second image here can be a kind of a variation on the hallback array. You can get a bit of an optimization by putting these diagonally magnetized magnets. And there's also many other things you can do, like you can have several magnets in a row of the same direction magnetization to get their, to get your optimized levitation or braking array. How, how big would uh, like one of these magnets be in order to uh, test out this hypothesis? Or can you get, do it like on a small scale or do these have to be kind of large magnets? Uh, I mean, you can, you can certainly do it in a, Small scale, yeah, the yeah. question is just how uh, significant you'll affect, you'll see it. Mm. The magnets probably have to be decently strong uh, mm -hmm. for you to see it. And uh, actually putting together these hallback arrays is very tough. Uh, uh, you need to look up some uh, kind of tips because you need basically the magnets try to push away very strong. In mm -hmm. our case, in the Purdue Hyperloop team, yeah. we use our magnet size for an inch cubed, which are decently big. And they're neodymium N52s, which are the strongest commercially available permanent magnets. Uh, so we actually didn't even end up, you know, messing around with those. We had some other professionals work with it because we didn't want to deal with it. But the, yeah. kind of, if you wanted to do it, the way sort of I've heard is uh, you'd want to sort of have some sort of large, either it's a wooden or aluminum case, has to be pretty strong. Mm -hmm. You load the magnets and you need some way to sort of clamp them into place as you load the next one in. Yeah. And you'd also want to glue them together so they don't fall apart. So there's a lot of uh, wow. it's <laughs> a lot of challenges with the suspension <laughs> between strong magnets. It's it's better just to do this theoretically, not actually do it in person. And <laughs> or, well, yeah. you get. I mean, there there are uh, quite a few companies that work with this sort of uh, stuff. So uh, okay. You get some of them to help. Oh, good. <laughs> Outsource it. Cool. Thanks. Another very interesting thing is this rotating hallback arrays wow. so kind of the idea here is if you take a magnet and you were just spin it just let's say a large disc magnet or it could be any shape really forget about the hallback arrays for a second so if we just take a large uh, magnet and spin it we'll get the same effect that we saw earlier that's just the same permanent magnet spinning mm -hmm. and you're going to get a lift even though like if they're mounted on a vehicle the vehicle isn't moving but it's still levitating with the spin mm -hmm. and you can see in the second image that there is, it's composed of you know these smaller magnets here, and in this case, you know you can also make those into hallback arrays. Kind of so each of those magnetic, each of those small magnets makes their own hallback array, and it just continues around the circle. Wow, how how fast is spinning with this disc be? Would it uh, pretty fast or? Yeah. So in the case of 
at least the experience of Purdue High Loop, when we, with the magnetic arrays we chose, we didn't go with the spinning. We just went with the passive. Uh, but like we're sort of looking at target speeds of like 150 miles per hour. Wow. So you'd have to spin the, uh, spin this such that it goes at that, such at that relative um, speed, the circle would be 150 miles per hour. Wow. That's to spin pretty fast, you know, larger. And the challenge is that remember you get, you do get the braking force still with this so in this case it doesn't slow down your pod but that braking force is the force that your motor actually has to overcome when spinning oh, huh. these discs so it's wow. actually like a force on that motor yeah wow to overcome so if that makes sense the braking force is acting against your motor or against whatever it is you're spinning yeah. whoa so, so um that's that's a lot of variables to kind of keep track of <laughs> yeah and that yeah. certainly makes this a very uh difficult yeah, I think to yeah account for it because I mean you're spinning, so you do have like a lot of forces <laughs> just naturally in spinning, mm -hmm. and also because of the magnetic <laughs> yeah. force, more variables to account for. Uh, so it's a very it's a very interesting topic, I think, but certainly very challenging. And like for us, we sort of looked at this and the Purdue High Fluid team, but sort of decided that was not efficient for our applications. Mm. Mm, interesting. I want to wrap up with some kind of tying it more to the Hyperloop application side. Here's a picture of, I had to show off a little bit, but of our uh, Purdue Hyperloop pod actually in the That's awesome. uh, SpaceX tube. Wow. Uh, so I'll go over first. Here's like our magnetic array. You can see in this image, it was actually 19 magnets. We had four of these, but they're all 19 magnets. Each magnet is a mm. cubic inch. So it was a very large, very dangerous thing to work with. <laughs> Wow. You can see in this bottom image here that uh, this is our bottom layout from the bottom looking up at our pod and you see where the four magnetic arrays are. Hmm. Some them are highlighted, then there are other two on the other side. Oh yeah. Then you can hopefully sort of see where they would be hmm. on this pod in this image. You can't see them from here, but they're at the bottom. You can sort of line up the images, you know, to see where they'd be. Hmm. And SpaceX gave us this uh, two, you can see this conductive surface, which is aluminum subtract that extends away on the tube. And it was one on the other side. So we levitated over these. Hmm. So the magnet array is kind of like a, a ski. <laughs> yeah. It's kind um, of like a long ski. And you had four of them on the bottom. And yeah, so then the eye beam in the center would kind of go to kind of guide the left and right movement. But So the guide and also we use it for braking. So you can uh, see in the, in the middle, we have these eight, oh, yeah. like the eight blocks. There are also different hallback arrays that were optimized for the braking. Oh my goodness. Wow. So... In the case of the levitation, yeah, actually the uh, levitation is very inefficient at low speeds mm -hmm. and probably only gets more efficient at like if you go up to speeds of over 50 miles per hour or so. Whoa. So you have to uh, really, you know, maybe kind of think of a system if you want to use this where at low speeds you kind of lift up the magnets completely mm -hmm. or something so that they don't interact with your subjects at all. So, you, you know, because you're not levitating much, but you're getting a lot of braking force. So you want to lift that up to not get that braking force. And once you get the high enough speeds, you can deploy them down. Then you levitate without much braking. Hmm. Wow. So thank you so much. I mean, this is, I, I wanted to learn more about magnetic levitation and hyperloop applications. And um, now I, I really feel like I can speak to this. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks a lot for having me. This was certainly yeah. a very interesting topic. Happy to talk about it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron.